Good morning. Welcome to the Midwest Dream Car Collection. We're excited to have you all here. My name is Sherry Minnick. I am the Events and Operations Manager here at Midwest Dream Car. So, um, and we're happy to introduce today Doug Malone, who is our Vehicle Operations Manager here, and he knows pretty much everything about any car so so far anyway. <laughs> than I am. He knows more than me, which doesn't take much, but yeah. So. But so let's give him a big welcome and he'll get started here. Thank you, Sherry, and thank you all for coming out today. It's always fun to do tread talks, and it's especially fun to do them when you have a really, really fun car to talk about. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about this car, a little bit about the history behind the car, and hopefully it'll make much more sense to you after we get done with this talk today of how this car came to be. First of all, the name, Amphicar 770. What's that all about? Well, it's Ampha for obvious for amphibious, meaning that it's capable of both land and water, which is very true for the Amphicar. 770, that comes from seven knots on the water, or approximately eight miles per hour, and about a top speed of 70 miles per hour on land. So that's where the name Amphicar 770 comes from. That was the only model there was. There was no 769 or, or 771 or whatever. It was just this, this one car and all the five years that it was produced. The Amphicar was a fun yet quirky little car, and people didn't know quite what to make of it. Now, you got to think when this car came out in uh, 1961, when it was introduced at the uh, New York Auto Show, uh, what the cars were like in 1961. Big behemoths, still big luxury cars, lots of big family cars, uh, little cars, economy cars were just starting to make an appearance in the United States. And so here comes a little Amphicar, and it's not only small, much smaller than what it was on the road at that time for a lot of cars, but also went in the water, and people didn't quite know what to make of that. But um, as we learn more about the car today, you'll find out it does make more sense. But not everybody was on board with it, like this gentleman, Dan Neal from Time, said it's a vehicle that promised to revolutionize drowning. <coughs> its flotation was entirely dependent on the weather. The bilge pump could keep out the leakage. In reality, a well-maintained amphicar does not leak at all and can be left in the water, parked at the dockside for many hours, and that is true. We've had this one in the lake. It has two bilge pumps, and actually one that came from the factory, the next additional one in case that one quits, uh, just as a backup. We had it in the lake oh, back in the 1st of June for our reveal for a couple hours. There was very little water, if any, that got into this car. So they are very watertight if they are done correctly and, and uh, maintained the way they should be. Obviously, it is a car. It's a heavy car. And if it leaks, it will sink to the bottom of the lake just like anything else. So let me tell you, I was a little bit nervous the first time I put this in the water. I was hoping it didn't become a very expensive anchor. But uh, it, it did just as it was uh, designed to do. It's a fun little car. It's known by some as the fastest boat on land and the fastest car in the water. Manufactured by the Quant Group in West Germany. Of course, Quant Group now is known for uh, being BMW. Uh, production was 1960 to 65, and the final number on the Amphicars cars was a little over under, under 3,900, so 3,878. Now their goal was to build 25 to 30,000 of these cars, so they didn't meet their goal by any means. But uh, now you see there, it says production 1960 to 65, but model years 1961 to 68, that doesn't make any sense. Well, the reason for that is they produced the cars from 1960 to about 1963. They had, that's when they stopped full production of the cars but they had enough parts that they kept building them sporadically through 1965. Then they had all these cars they hadn't sold. So they marketed them for a couple more years. In the United States, that can only be through 1967. 1968, US regulations changed with uh, emissions and safety things, and they were no longer allowed to be imported in the United States. So there were no 1968 Amphicars in the United States. But they were titled the year they were sold. For example, this car is a 1966 Amphicar. It may very well have been built in 1963 or 64, but it wasn't sold till 1966. So that's when the title was signed over and that's when the year was assigned. So uh, it's very common with imported cars that they were titled that way. So, but the body styles and everything never changed, so it really didn't make any difference. So that's the story kind of behind why you see the differences in the years. The designer was a gentleman by the name of Hans Triple. A um, little bit about the wheelbase, about 84 inches, uh, length about 171, height 60 inches, weight 2,343 pounds, uh, 0 to 60 in 43 seconds. You're not going to outrun anybody in this little baby, but uh, 
uh, it's actually performs pretty well. We've had it out on the highway on our way out to the lake and it does pretty good. I had it up to about 60 maybe at the highest and that was plenty fast in this little car. Um, it probably would have done a little bit more than that, but uh, that's where I felt comfortable bringing it up to. And the price when new was about $2,800 to $3,200. And I say that, it's kind of like the Model T. And every year that it came out, the price went down just a little bit. They were trying to sell them, get them moved. And so the first ones were actually more expensive than the ones that came out and were sold later. Now this one, Lyndon Johnson was a huge fan of the Amphicar. And he had one they used down on his ranch down in Texas. And I thought, well, should this be called Amphi One? You've know, got Air Force One and stuff. Maybe this is Amphi One. But uh, Lyndon Johnson loved to terrorize his guests. He'd take him out in his little amphicar. They wouldn't know what it was. He'd be driving around his ranch, and he had a big lake there. He'd go tearing down the hill in this amphicar and go, the brakes are out, the brakes are out. And he'd hit the water, and people would be panicking. Then the car would start floating. He'd turn the props and take off, and they'd breathe a sigh of relief. But he had apparently a lot of fun uh, scaring his guests on the ranch with this little car. But it was actually his favorite car, he said. A little bit about the designer, Hans Trippel. Now, I want to clarify, I've got this H-A-N-S, because I've seen it both ways. I've seen it H-A-N-S and H-A-N-N-S. I'm not sure which is correct, but this spelling was the one I saw the most. That's what I'm using for purposes today. Um, he was a German industrial engineer, designer, who spent his entire professional life planning, developing, and building amphibious cars. With the exception of the VW Schwimm wagon, the name of this imaginative self-made man is connected with the amphibious idea since the early 1930s. Born in 1908 in Germany and passed away in 2001 in Germany. Quite a character. Um, he came out with this car in the early 1930s, the Lond Wasser Zepp, however you pronounce it, swim wagon, um, and presented this to Hitler in 1935. Uh, Hitler liked the car and uh, had um, uh, Hans, Zeppelin, or Hans take over the Bugatti factory, which had closed down. So they started building these in the old Bugatti family, uh, factory up until about 1941. Uh, he, the car changed a little bit to this triple SG6. This is one that was used the most by the uh, Nazis for the World War II, but they only made about 800 of these cars. There's not a lot of them out there. And the reason they only made about 800 because in 1941, uh, they started using the VW Schwimm wagon. Uh, this car was just overall a better car, handled better, it was lighter weight, uh, maneuvered better, and uh, so they switched, uh, put Hans Trippel out of a job, but uh, they sold about 15,000 of these to, to the war force and the German war force. So uh, anyway, uh, that's kind of the story behind uh, Trippel and the Nazis and the amphibious car uh, that we know back then. So what happened then? After Germany surrendered, Trippel was out of a job when his SG6 was replaced by the VW Schwimm wagon in 1941. The Bugatti plant was turned into a munitions plant. Triple was arrested as a war profiteer and spent the next three years in a French prison after Germany's surrender. He later married the daughter of one of his former prison mates. Now, he was a pretty bright guy, and he knew this, this, this guy had a really attractive daughter, but he also understood that the father-in-law, his future father-in-law, had uh, inherited a couple of dormant factories. And so he married the daughter and talked to his father-in-law and to let him use one of the dormant factories to help start and produce his amphibious cars again. So, uh, pretty clever guy in his planning of things. Now, something I don't think a lot of people know was one of the things that, that Triple did early on was build this, this car here as a prototype. He was concerned, obviously, about water getting into the car. So he decided if he built the doors up higher above the water line, that would help him from leaking. So he came up with this really unique hinged gullwing type door. Well, Mercedes saw this and they liked it. They were coming out with this new Mercedes 300 SL, but it had a problem because the frame on this car was very high for the threshold. They were trying to figure out how to do the doors and make them where it was easy accessible. So they bought the rights and the patent from Triple and used it on the Mercedes Gullwing. That was known today as a Mercedes Gullwing car. Uh, very popular car that's worth about one and a half million dollars today. So um, all because of Triple's little design door over here. Pretty cool, those connection. Um, later on in the early 1950s, Triple continued to work on small amphibious cars that would appeal to the civilian masses. He really wanted it to be a, not a war car necessarily or a military car, but to be something that everybody would, uh, would like to have. But he was in financial trouble. His design did appeal to a small French automobile company called Marathon. They were wanting to build a small, lightweight, fiberglass race-type car, sports car. So Trick 
Triple went to work for them, took off for Paris, and tweaked the design, which would become the Marathon Corsair that you see here. Later on, uh, he came out with the Alligator. By the 1950s, uh, the U.S. market had asked them to, to kind of design something for the U.S. market, and so he came out with his Alligator. It's a three-seat convertible. The driver's seat's in the middle, and you can kind of see the driver right there in the middle. The steering wheel's in the middle, kind of unique. Um, the company group Quant started to get interested in this floating roadster, bought the license, and improved the Alligator to become the amp uh, Amphicar. So this is kind of the early prototype of what this Amphicar uh, looked like in the late 1950s. Now, the Amphicar was the only car that came out that's amphibious, and some of these you've probably heard about. Uh, in 1985, um, Germans came out with this Amphi Ranger. Um, let me just read this article because I'll forget something if I don't. Okay, in the mid-1980s, German oil and gas pipeline supplier was laying pipe in some pretty inaccessible places around the world. Rather than spending money on building roads and bridges, the company decided to build a vehicle that would require neither. The Amphi Ranger was born in 1985. With four-wheel drive and a decent grunt from a Ford V6, an aluminum body that was part G-Wagon and part paddle boat, and a retractable propeller, the amphibious Ranger would go just about anywhere. Alongside the intended industrial use, a few German police forces operated the Amphi Rangers, while an enterprising British duo also tried to sell them to the public. The vehicle was a brilliant concept, tremendous fun, and seemingly well engineered. The price, however, was a little over a quarter of a million dollars in today's money. So guess what? Nobody was able to buy them. In 1995, the world waved goodbye to the Amphi Ranger. So that was one well-designed vehicle, just cost too much money, put a lot of people out of the market on it really quick. Another company that came out with one was Gibbs. Uh, the Gibbs Aquata uh, came out in 2003, 2004. World's first high-speed amphibian uh, car, capable of 100 miles per hour on land and over 30 on the water. Uh, it only built prototypes. They never did market any to the public. There were about 20, 25 of them that were produced uh, before they closed down. And uh, my understanding is they are for sale for around a quarter of a million dollars a piece now today too. So. Um, I don't know if we'll ever have one here at the museum or not, but uh, if someone wants to make a donation, we'll try to find one. How he came to get this little car right before you here. We attended the Sotheby's car auction in Elkhart, Indiana, just about a year ago. Um, and this Ampha car was one of the cars that was being auctioned off. Now, unfortunately for the guy that was having to sell him, he was arrested for fraud and his entire um, inventory of cars and other things were being liquidated. He had a huge collection. The value was about $44 million worth of cars. Uh, this Amphi car was one of them. So when we saw this little car, we thought, boy, we've been looking for an Amphi car, and this one just fits the bill. So we, we bid on it, and I probably paid a little bit too much for it. But uh, we got it, and we don't regret it. It's just a great car. Uh, one of the neat things about this car we found out after we bought it was uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Hugh Gordon out in California. Now, you probably don't know who Gordon is, but I didn't either before I knew about the Amphicar. But Hugh, when they quit producing uh, or selling Amphicars in 1968, Hugh Gordon bought all the leftover inventory from the Amphicar Corporation. Now, you've got to remember, they were planning on building 30,000 cars when they made 3,800. There were a lot of leftover parts. So Hugh bought all that inventory and was just the um, father of the Amphicar family for finding parts and supplies. He also restored cars. We found this was the last car that he restored before he passed away. And the company, um, Gordon Imports out in California, said he was the most proud of this one here. This is one of the nicest ones he ever did. So we didn't know that when we bought it. We found that out after the fact. And we have to agree it's really well done and correctly done. But it didn't look like this when Hugh got it. It looked like this. And you can see a lot of these amphibious cars, of course, they go in the water, they're prone to rust. Uh, especially if you put them in salt water, they're really rust fast. But Hugh stripped this one down to the bare metal. You can see some areas he had to cut out and replace. Uh, the dashboard, missing some pieces, faded out. A lot of them are, are pretty rough when they're found today. But Hugh brought this one back to life. He did restore this for the gentleman that we were just talking about a little bit ago that, that unfortunately lost the car through investigation. But uh, um, anyway, it didn't look like this when he bought it. Uh, the cat up there kind of protecting it, I guess. Now, there's some, a couple other shots of what it looked like. So no matter how bad your car looks, there is hope for it, is what this picture is showing you. This is after they got the fresh coat of paint put back on, after they got the body straightened and fixed. 
And the one thing important with Amphicar is it needs to be watertight and everything is welded, then lead sealed. Um, it needs to be airtight, watertight, or watertight, not so airtight. New Lagoon paint, paint is one of the colors that they offered. This is when it was just completed, ready to be shipped off. The gentleman that had, had it restored. They were all convertibles, all had black tops. Um, came in four different colors. Ford green, beach sand white, lagoon blue, which is what this is in regatta red. You'll see some out there are different colors. Those have been custom colors that have been painted on them. But when they first came out, those were the four colors that they were offered in. Little engine in them is a Triumph. Uh, little Triumph Herald 1147 cubic uh, centimeter inline four cylinder engine, about 43 horsepower, whopping 43. Now, as the Amphicar continued to be built over those uh, five years, the engines, they did replace them with some with a little bit more CC. This one actually has a 1493 CC uh, inline four cylinder in it. Same engine, just a little bit bigger and uh, so a little more powerful. It's a 65 horsepower, so it's really, really beastly. But um, you can see the radiator kind of has a cant to it. And the engine's in the back, I should mention. Um, battery box is over here. And when we're done here, I'm going to open this car up and you can come check it out really good. I'll open the front and the back and you can look underneath it or whatever you want to do. But anyway, that's the engines in the car. There is a bilge pump, actually two in this car. Uh, one interesting thing about this car, it has two floors. It has the floor that your feet go on, where the pedals and stuff are. About eight inches below that is actually the hole of the boat. I mean, it's all the bottom of the, the car. So if water leaks into it, it goes into that cavity in between. And then you can turn the bilge pump on, and the bilge pump will spit it out the back. And you'll see there's a pipe in the back above the water line back there. So pretty clever the way it's designed. I always get asked, well, how do you operate the car on land and in the water? Well, it drives just like a car on land. It has a four-speed transmission very similar to a Volkswagen setup. Um, and then this little lever down here is the propellers. So when you go to put it in the lake, you drive it in like you normally would. And then once you're in the water, you put it in neutral and then pull the lever forward. And that puts the propellers going in a forward direction. There's dual propellers in the back. And then to operate the speed, you just operate with the gas pedal like you would a car. Now, the other thing that's interesting is you steer it in the water just like you do on land. You use a steering wheel. The front wheels are what are your rudder, and amazingly, it steers remarkably well. You wouldn't think the tires and water would be any good, but it does steer very well. The only thing that does not work in the water are the brakes. <laughs> so if you want to stop, you throw the lever back into reverse really rapidly and goose it and try to get the car to slow down before you hit whatever you're headed towards. But um, anyway, it's a, it drives remarkably well. And, and the fun thing is, is when you first pulled up the boat ramp and all these people around there, they got their boat trailers and headaches of trying to get the boat on the trailer. You just, just cruise right in the lake and take off and then you just pull right back out. They're just glaring at you like, what in the heck just happened? So it's, it's fun. It's really a fun little car to take out and, um, and drive. <clears throat> Dashboard, a lot of knobs on this car and it took us a lot to figure out what they all were. Uh, we actually had to call the Amphicar place and ask them what some of these were. Um, the one over here is uh, the navigation lights. You'll see the navigation lights up here on the car. And since it is a boat, it is required to have navigation lights um, and a flag. Uh, you have to have a, a life jackets for everybody and a fire extinguisher and things like that to be able to put it in the lake. Now in Kansas, they also require that you have a license to have the numbers on the side. Uh, our, thank uh, goodness, uh, the kindness of our Kansas Department of Wildlife. They said we wouldn't have to have them for that day that we took it out. They let us get a pass on it. So we wouldn't have these awful numbers on the side of it. But um, that is the same boating regulations required on this as it would be on a regular boat putting it in the water. Um, this little switch over here is the windshield wipers. This is your bilge pump switch that came from the factory. There's another little button down here. That's the accessory bilge pump that you put in. Uh, these three buttons down here are the heater controls. This little knob here is kind of a lake cruise control. You don't want to use this on land, but when you're on the water, you can pull that out. It works like cruise control. You don't have to hold the pedal down, so you can just drive it uh, without pushing the pedal. A uh, little light up here lights up red when the propellers are turned on, so you remember that they're on. Uh, the propellers uh, they were, we were told that when you get the car back online to be sure to shut those back off. 
The transmission for these are designed to have the force of the water. And when you don't have that, it will damage the transmission if you leave them on too long for the propellers. So that's why the little light's on there lets you know that you've got it on. Um, this is your headlights. Cigarette lighter, because everybody smoked back then. And uh, ignition switch, ashtray, and then the handbrake. Horn buttons in the middle, directional signal, just like we would on a normal car. So that's kind of what's all on the dashboard. And you're welcome to come and look at it closer here in just a minute. We already talked about the navigation lights on the car. This little deal right here is the horn. And uh, that's up there, so it's out of the water. <laughs> kind of little Volkswagen type horn, doesn't it? So uh, I want to get one of those big Steamliner type horns for it. I think that'd be awesome. But, uh, anyway, that's what that is. Uh, you'll notice when you come around and you look at it later, the exhaust pipe and the, the bilge pump pipes are very high on the back, and that's to be above the water line. The water line comes up to about where that black trim piece is on the side when you're in the water. I always get asked, well, how do you keep water out of it? Doesn't it leak in around the doors? There's actually a double seal on the door. So once you get in the car, uh, there's another lever that you pull that really cinches that door against those double rubber gaskets. It is very watertight, but it's like anything. If you don't seal it correctly, it will fill up with water and sink to the bottom of the ground. Other thing you need to remember to do, there's a drain plug at the bottom of the car. So if water gets in it, when you pull it out, you can drain the water out of it that the bilge pump doesn't get all out. If you don't remember to put that plug back in, it'll fill up with water and sink to the bottom of the lake. So you have to remember to do these things or it will become an anchor. <clears throat> this is when we took it out in the lake uh, for our June reveal. Shows it out. It's in the river pond area out at Tuttle Creek. That's right when we first put it in, you can see the boat ramp. So conclusion, although there are many who criticize the Amphicar, it was a pioneering vehicle that has built up a strong and enthusiastic user based in the International Amphicar Owners Club. Among the famous people who have owned one or operated are previously mentioned President Lyndon Johnson, John Lennon had one, even pop star Madonna who used an Amphicar in her music video Burning Up. Amphicars today bring premium prices, often selling for $50,000 for an average condition to well over six figures for a really nice example. Pretty good return on profit if you bought one back in the 1960s and paid $2,500 for it. There's about 400 of them that are left worldwide, they believe, out of 3,800. Most all of them are seaworthy. Uh, there are some basket cases that are rusting away in garages that haven't had a chance to be restored yet. But they've really gained kind of a cult following, and they're a lot of fun. Um, the International Amphicar has what they call swim-in several times a year where a bunch of Amphicar owners get together and take them out in the lake together. Just a fun time. We hope to participate in one of those in the coming years. Uh, it'd be fun to get one here in Manhattan. I'd love to do that if we could somehow work that out. But um, anyway, here's a little video that uh, Ron Frank, our videographer, did for me after our reveal. I'm going to show you. Kind of shows you the fun we had with the car that day. I'd like to thank all of you for coming out tonight for our first reveal this year. It's called an Amphicar 770, and the 770 comes from 7 miles per hour on water, 70 miles per hour on land. I can tell you it goes 7 miles per hour on the water, but I don't know if it'll go 70 on the highway. <laughs> it was designed by a, a German by the name of Hans Trippel back in the 1930s. He actually uh, was approached by Hitler to build an Amphicar. Uh, amphibious car for the Nazi uh, war force and uh, he did but Volkswagen came out with one called a Schwimmer swim wagon that actually got accepted and was used for, for military purposes but that didn't keep Hans Griffel from uh, uh, still pursuing the amphibious cars and so he kept working on it in 1960 
they came out with the Amphicar. It was built in West Germany, in Berlin, and 90% of the Amphicars were shipped over to the United States. And of course, being a boat, it has to meet Coast Guard regulations. That's why you see the navigation lights on and the flag. Outside of that, it drives pretty much like a car. Now you say, well, how do you drive a car in the water? It's got a four-speed transmission in it, a Volkswagen-type transmission designed by Porsche, and four forward gears, one reverse. Once you put it in the water, there's another lever that you put the land transmission in neutral and push the other lever up, and that turns the propellers on in the back. Both the propellers operate at the same time. There's one forward speed, one reverse speed. Now, how do you steer it? It's like you steer a car. There's no rudder in this car. You steer it with the front tires. So when you turn, the tires act as your rudder. So it's, it's pretty unique in the way it operates. Anyway, that's the Amphicar. Are there any questions anybody has? If not, you're welcome to come up and just check it out. Yeah, Greg. You're talking about that bilge pump. When do you know to turn it on other than when your feet are covered by Well, that's a good question. I would oftentimes forget to turn it on and wouldn't turn it on until we got out. And ours, this one, fortunately, never had any water in it except once. That's when we got stuck on a sandbar and we had to really back it up fast and water camp over the back of it. <laughs> but uh, uh, Nick didn't have as quite a confidence, so Nick always turned on the minute he hit the water, just, just to be sure. But uh, uh, there, yeah, you, I, and it's because it's got that false floor and it would be full of water before it actually came up on, under the pedals. So you probably have a problem before that. But uh, probably the safe thing is just to turn it on when you put it in the water, just as a backup. Yeah, yeah. When you're coming out of the water, uh, can you have it in gear at the same time the props are on? You can. They recommend you know you put it in first when you're coming up out of the water and still have the propellers on. You'll need that to help push it up to the ramp because it is a rear-wheel drive car. Uh, once your water, your front wheels hit the ramp, you still don't have any um, land uh, uh, friction yet until the back wheels hit. So yeah, put it in first, keep the propellers on. Then once you pull it up, get going up the ramp, you can reach down and shut the propellers off and drive it on up. When was the last time you had that in water? Last time we had in the water was when we did the reveal in June, this summer. Yes. Will that paint not rust eventually? Oh, everything will rust. Yeah, it will. Uh, well, something that's not mentioned in this presentation or in the video, but uh, they Amphicar recommends after five hours in the water that you grease it in 13 different places. So it is a little bit of a maintenance issue. And one of those points, you have to remove the back seat to get to. So uh, that's one of the reasons it didn't sell real well. A lot of people don't want to have to do that kind of maintenance on their car. They just want to drive it. Um, our mechanic, Nick, when we got this back, he actually pulled the wheels off, dried all the brakes out, really dried it off really good to make sure it wasn't water going to rust anything and greased everything up real good. So to maintain them correctly, you need to be very careful with it make sure, of course, the, the finish on it's kept nice and stuff like that. Cause it's just like anything. It's like our car. It'll, it will rust if you don't maintain them. Then they will leak. <laughs> Any other questions? Does it have an anchor on it? Only if you fill it full of water. <laughs> They did come with anchors, and they were used by uh, uh, some of the German police department had some, and, and I forget who else used them for emergency-type vehicles that came with anchors and, and some different uh, equipment in them. Um, but uh, you certainly could, you know, toss an anchor over to keep it where you want it. How big is the gas tank, and where is it? It's 13 gallons, and it's in the back. 
I'm sorry, it's in the front. It sits right up, right up here. And when we pop the hood in here in a minute, you'll be able to see where, where it is. This was right along the front of the car right here. But 13 gallons. The car gets about, they say about, uh, oh, I've got to remember now what they said, how many miles per, per hour in the water. I think it's eight, eight miles. I'm not going to remember. It's eight gallons. I, I'm not, I can't answer that. I can't think right now what it was. It does good, though. It does really an economical little car. About miles per hour, or you know, what's the gas mileage? Gas mileage is about 35 miles per gallon, so it does really good. Did that guy that invented it? What was was he thinking? This would go over big and just be, you know, on He did. He always had the vision of really making a popular amphibious car that would appeal to the masses, the civilian masses. Uh, of course, the Amphicars wished they thought they'd produce you know, 25 or 30,000 of these right off the bat, and, and this never happened. It was, it was too, you know, you could buy this car for $2,500, or you could buy a new Mustang, you know, and that generation that this car would appeal to, like, like something more sporty. Um, the, other, the other people, you know, family cars, not a good family car. You know, it's ideal if you live by a lake or something like that, but because it did take a lot of maintenance to keep them maintained and running correctly, people just didn't want to mess with them, so they just never never went over. Is the museum looking for a flying car? Looking for a what? A flying car. Yes, yes. We'd love to have, you know, we're always interested in anything unique. So anything that we want to go to auctions to see unique things, we're automatically gravitate towards those to see what we can find. And, and I know Ward and Brenda, uh, our benefactors here at the museum, really want some amazing things in this museum. So this museum in the years ahead, you're going to find some really unique and beautiful, beautiful things. So uh, we're just getting started. So come up and check this out. I'll open it up. You can sit in it. You can look at it and just see what the Amphicar is all about it. So thank you all again for coming.